Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here and you begin to love what you are hearing, please consider joining us by hitting that subscribe button. And don't forget the bell. Make sure that one's set to all. That way you won't miss every time I upload, which happens to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to tip me with a cup of coffee, the information can be found down below. Now, with all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Terrifying Dark Web Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before I read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Warning, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. Being an author on the internet is not the easiest thing to do. I write stories that are fiction and people read or listen to them. I would say that maybe 50,000 people listen per month, maybe more. It's a lot of work, but I really enjoy writing horror stories. Okay, I did enjoy writing horror stories until this little creeper came along. This guy creeps on everyone. He has every social media known for all things dark. He enjoys harassing women, content creators, and does it often. Does he do it on purpose? Yes, I'm sure he does. He had been reported so many times and lost accounts on various services and complains about it every time. Because of him, I've added several outside web security cams around my house. At first, they worked well and maybe a little too well. It grew quite annoying seeing messages pop up about the wildlife in the area, or trees blowing in the wind, so I turned the motion sensor down just a notch. It works a lot better now, except there is one big problem. Ghosting. I'm not sure if you know what ghosting is, but when you see weird shapes that might look human but are hard to decipher because there is a lot of fog or static, on the image or video? Yeah, that's ghosting. My cameras have recently been ghosting late at night. I thought it might be a bird or some other creature, but it looks like it walks on two legs and is in human form. Most of my video footage is written over by the next day, so I didn't get too many images of this thing. I did send a couple to the local police, but they simply told me it wasn't a human and I shouldn't worry about it. Then, the other night, I saw a face in one of these images. I almost lost my breakfast. The face was of a 20-something-year-old man. It was definitely a face and a body. I couldn't quite see the body, though. It was all fuzzy. The face was actually there on top of the body. I showed it to the police, and they opened a trespassing file, but didn't do anything about it. Oh boy, thank you. I've started to get really weird emails now with what looks like threats. The URLs are really weird and will not open on a regular browser. I have to open them on Tor, which means I have to go into the dark web to find them. The images are usually very threatening and as of recently, they have started looking like me and that face in the camera that night. Then, the other night, I was sent a dark web picture of the same images I was seeing on the camera. The exact same images. So, this guy has somehow hacked into my security system. He also has it set to some sort of weird web page that has a countdown to it in a chat room. People keep visiting this chat room and making Bitcoin bids. The countdown ends tonight, a minute before midnight. I'm thinking about heading out of town, but I have to bring my animals. 
I also received a message from the creeper that I talked about earlier. The message said, see you soon. No one can find him. The feds and the cops are clueless as to who he is. I don't know what to do. What would you do in my situation? I will admit, first off, that I have heard of a lot of these deep web, dark web stories and have always called bullshit. However, a close friend of mine swore that she had been to this place and that she had seen some really messed up things. Some she would talk about, others she refused. She said some of the things she had seen would haunt her for the rest of her life. I should have just let it go at that, but I wanted to believe that she was making it all up and that there was no such place. But I was the one that was wrong. You know the drill by now. I downloaded Tor, Onion, and found the hidden wiki. I've been warned about some of the links and how they can trick you into some really crazy and horrible things. I clicked a few. They were mostly sex meetups, escort requests, drug deals. Needless to say, I was really starting to think I was right and that the deep web was just an easy way to make shady deals that couldn't be traced. It was lame, tame, and a little bit boring. I looked around for something remotely interesting until I found the link, the Night Watchmen. Okay, this could be interesting. I was thinking it might be some guy telling creepy stories or walking around a sleepy town at night or something. What greeted me was a flat black page with three videos blown up to cover the space sitting side by side in a line. They were paused, and on each of them was a picture of different people. The first one had a family of four, mom, dad, and two little girls. The second was a couple with a female being very obviously pregnant. The third was just one woman and her dog, a cute black lab with a white streak over his left eye. Before I could study them for too long, a voice came through. It was male, but slightly distorted, so I couldn't really hear what he actually sounded like. Here is what he said. Good evening. Tonight, the Night Watchmen have brought you three unique households. Each of them lives different lives, believe different things, have different future plans. He stops here and clears his throat. For the next part, it sounded like he was smiling. Watch each video and then choose one. I really didn't understand the point of the task, but honestly, my interest was piqued. I was curious about where this was going. I clicked the first video. There wasn't much to it and showed the family in their home, skipping through moments of them watching TV, playing in the backyard, having supper, the parents putting the kids to bed, started to make love. It cut off there. Thank God. I was starting to feel like a weird creep. I was seeing a part of people's lives that were meant for only them. I reluctantly clicked the next video. It was transported into the home of a young couple getting ready to start a family. It skipped through to them in the baby's room, hugging and generally looking excited. They ate salads at the kitchen table, went through mail, looked through baby books and magazines, watched a show on TV, and then went to bed, snuggling up together. This one was so sweet I couldn't help but smile at what I had seen. However... I was still a voyeur in their personal moments. I had gone through the others. I figured it was only right to watch the last one. This one was of a single woman living with just her dog. She was a bit of a slob. She had dishes piled up, laundry on a love seat in the living room, and trash that was overflowing. 
The other two had been pretty tidy, the family having some toys and laundry lying around, the couple with the very clean house. I wondered if there was a point to that, since it did show these aspects of the videos. Anyway, the woman seemed lonely. She watched a lot of TV, ate a half gallon of ice cream, checked her cell phone every few moments, obviously hoping for a call or text, played fetch with her dog, Fetty, and then went to bed, taking her phone with her. She began to masturbate, and I began to feel incredibly awkward. Thankfully, this one ended there as well. I waited to see what was next. The video reset and went back to the stills of each one again. The voice came back over and said, Now that you have seen, which one will you choose? I sat there and watched, praying that someone else was here watching this too and would choose. But nothing happened for a few minutes. The videos disappeared and another three videos began playing simultaneously. These turned my stomach. There were three tall men. I assumed they were men by what character I could catch. They each wore the same clothing, black shirt, pants, boots, and a long trench coat that dangled around their ankles. To top it all, they each wore a large, wide-brimmed black hat. Have you decided? Which one will you choose? The voice chimed in over the obviously live feed. Death comes on swift wings for our ill-fated friends. You must choose one. That is how the game goes. He thought this was a game? I was horrified. Was I really supposed to choose who died here and who survived? It was ridiculous, and I went to close the page down. Calmly, the voice began again. Before you close us down, you should know that if you do not choose one of the three shown here, your family will be next. I was startled by his declaration, but figured that he was just trying to scare me. He was doing a really good job, truthfully. Anna, he said. My heart skipped a beat. He said my name. Now, I was officially terrified. I just wanted this to stop. Anna, dear sweet Anna, I know it's a difficult choice, but it must be made. Please, if you will, direct the night watchmen to their chore. The original videos came back up, and I knew that meant it was time for me to pick someone to die. Maybe it is just a horrible joke that some hacker and his friends like to play on unsuspecting deep web surfers, I stated out loud. It was more to make me feel better than anything, even though my heart was still pounding. I looked at the people again. There was a family there, children. I couldn't choose them. Then, there was the expecting couple. I couldn't do this. It was too much. Choose. The normal calm voice barked at me. Choose now. I jumped and looked at the last one. It was the lonely woman with a dog for a companion. She had the least to lose. So, she was alone without kids or a husband. It wasn't okay, but I quickly clicked her video. Very well, so shall it be. The voice was calm and smooth once again. The videos of the Night Watchmen came back up. Night Watchmen, a choice has been made. You may attend to your work. I watched in complete horror as two of the Watchmen began walking toward the houses in front of them, and the third one walked away from a house. I was confused. I chose the lonely woman, but her watchman was walking away. He disappeared into the night, 
and the feed cut off. The other two videos grew bigger and took up the screen. What's going on? What's going on? That was all I could say. The two watchmen that it showed each effortlessly broke into the houses. I was biting my bottom lip so hard it bled. The feeds walked along with them as they each silently roamed through the houses. One watchman walked into the set of baby room and looked around gingerly, then made his way across the hall to the other bedroom. The other watchman walked slowly down the hall, seemingly trying to decide which room to enter. He chose the children's bedroom. I looked over to the first one. He stood at the foot of the sleeping couple's bed, holding a huge machete. He walked to one side and began swinging wildly. There were screams so loud and frightened that I felt I might pass out or throw up. I looked over to the other video reluctantly. The watchman stood in the children's room, right in the center of the pink bunk bed. It also brandished a machete. I screamed as he raised it up and reached it over and pulled the computer plug out of the wall. I was terrified, traumatized. What had I just witnessed? What had I just done? My mouth felt dry. My head was spinning out of control. My heart felt like it might burst from my chest. After several hours, I decided to check my computer and hope that the nightmare I had witnessed was gone. There was nothing. Days later, I was checking my email when I stopped and recoiled in horror. There was an email from the night watchman. I finally opened it. I really don't know why. Maybe I was hoping they would tell me I had been punked or something. Instead, it was just a few large words on an otherwise white background. Jenna, thank you for excluding her from a watchman fate. We thank you for your choices too. We truly enjoyed our encounter with you. Come play again anytime. Attached was a picture of the lonely woman walking her dog in the park, still looking down at her phone. I will never, ever access the dark web again. After uploading a number of horror stories to various places around the internet, I was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of supportive emails and messages I received. It spurred me on to write more, to take my ambition seriously, and to commit an increasing amount of my time to the pursuit of becoming a published author. Little did I know that this newfound acknowledgement of my writing would lead to a series of horrific and abhorrent events. For over a year, I received numerous messages and emails, most very positive and enjoyable. Yet, every few days, I would also find a strange, disconnected, fragmented piece of correspondence sitting in my inbox. Each mail would consist of one random word as a subject heading, with the message itself comprised of a simple phrase, normally only two words along. The email address would change each time, but it was clear from the nature of the content that the author was the same. At first, I dismissed them as the idle product of a bored lurker on the internet, attempting to amuse themselves with the thought of myself reading garbled, puzzling, yet worrying cryptic messages. As the days wore on, however, and the emails became gradually more twisted and prophetic, I began to suspect that they were of a far more sinister origin. I had posted and contributed to many websites and forums over the years, and it was not usual 
to wake up each morning to 20 or 30 new emails in my inbox. I often spent my lunch break answering them, and I genuinely enjoyed the correspondence. However, the day after posting a story called The Passenger, I followed my usual routine of logging into my email account at noon, only to find one message which stood out most uncomfortably from the others. The subject heading was supper, and the email itself contained just two words, baby fries. I sent the message to my trash folder and thought nothing more of it until later that night. It had been a long day, and as I had been writing from dawn to dusk, I was tiring rapidly, feeling suitably ready for a good, long, overdue sleep. It was around 11.30 p.m., and just as I started to drift off into a dream, I heard a noise. It was not out of place, nor did it cause any real concern to me coming as it did from the neighbor's house through the wall. It was the type of commotion sound any resident is familiar with. I smirked to myself thinking, <laughs> baby cries, and drifted back to sleep, sure that the child's mother or father would soon be there to comfort it, as they always were. I woke again, glancing at my mobile phone, which cast an unearthly green glow around the room. Seeing that it was after three in the morning, I became agitated, knowing that I had a long day ahead of me. Rest does not come easily on these nights, when we know we must rise early. The mere thought of the necessity of a good night's sleep before the next day's work precludes any notion of sleep itself. Lying there, I listened in the darkness to the infant next door, breaking its heart, inconsolable and distraught. Surely the parents had not let it scream for all those hours, lying there alone in the blackness of night, unattended. After trying to block out the child's cries for what seemed like hours, I admitted defeat and moved to the spare room that my family and friends normally stayed in on the rare occasions when they visited. At 7.30 a.m., my phone alarm sounded, and after fighting the reality of another day, I reluctantly left my bed, walking slowly to the kitchen to make some coffee. From the window, I looked out onto the street below. What I saw horrified me. A police car and two ambulances parked outside of my neighbor's home. Even though my groggy, pre-caffeinated mind, the memory of that helpless child crying in the night sprung to the fore. Immediately, I stopped what I was doing, threw on some clothes, and ran outside. I was not the only person watching, as the usual nosy residents stood at their doors, with some even out on the street, still wearing their dressing gowns, idly gossiping, whipping up, any number of scandalous numbers. Asking several onlookers what had happened, I was told a variety of accounts, from a child being abducted to someone having a seizure during the night. A hush fell over the street as my neighbor's front door finally opened, slowly. Three police officers exited the house somberly as a collective gasp seeped out of the mouths of the crowd of onlookers. Quickly behind, two men in sterile white clothing carried a stretcher, and on it, a body bag containing the now deceased remains of one of my former neighbors. A few cries rang out from across the street. Those who knew them wept, while those who did not gossiped. Then, another silence, followed by another stretcher and another body bag. This time, no one uttered a sound. The street was void of noise. A tangible tension spread through the air, a hanging sense of dread as all of us waited, hoping beyond hope for no more death. Heartbreak. The last stretcher, supporting a small, 
and insignificant shroud was carried out solemnly in the morning air and placed carefully into the back of an ambulance. Tears were wept and answers were demanded from the police, but I could not cope with the sight. I just could not bear it. The sight of that poor infant screaming throughout the night, screaming for its very life, rang out in my ears. The sound of a child now forever silent. The memory was deafening. How was I supposed to know? The child had cried before, as many do. I just did not know. I walked days back through my garden and into the now hollow sanctuary of my house. I'm not ashamed to say that I cry. Cry knowing that maybe if I had just paid attention or shown more concern than simply getting to sleep, that if I had noticed something was amiss, I could have called the police and then perhaps they would still be alive. Several hours later, two police officers arrived at my door to ask if I had seen or heard anything unusual from the night before. They said that they were not at liberty to tell me what had happened, but that any information I could give them would help immensely with their investigation. When I told them about the email I had received, they looked at each other with an obvious sense of skepticism. When I showed it to them, they asked if they could have my login details in an attempt to trace where the email came from. Of course, I gave it to them, and then they left after saying that they would be in touch. As soon as they were gone, I returned to the computer screen to switch it off. I recoiled in horror at the sight of another cryptic email sitting in my inbox. The subject head said, fan, and the email again contained only two short words, two words which drove fear through every part of my being. It simply read, you told. I was utterly unprepared for the events which followed. My friends say I'm a little crazy cruising around on the dark web like it's some place to hang out on my weekend night. I used to have a social life with them, so I guess they're just jealous. When I started college, we would all hang out together, but then I got really behind on some assignments, and these weren't just some assignments I could just do overnight. It was almost the end of the semester, and I was complaining in a forum somewhere that I hadn't read any of the material and didn't know what was going on. That's when a guy on the forum named The Jester spoke up. He messaged me privately and said I could probably buy those papers off the dark web if I had the money. I was curious to see what he was talking about, so... I downloaded the app and started visiting the website that he sent me. I'm going to be honest here. I would have never found these sites without his help because their links are just insanely stupid. These were mostly scanned images of other people's homework. Some were only a few bucks and others were in the thousands. I didn't have thousands, so I bought a few papers that cost me between five bucks to a couple hundred bucks each. I figured I could take pieces of the best ones and put them together. I'd spend all night reading them and then work out something in the morning. I went through most of them and took notes. They were really well written, and I was surprised to find out how easy it was to actually cheat on a paper using other people's work. I wasn't plagiarizing the material, but using them as a reference point. I didn't feel like reading three whole months of text just to pick out the information for the assignment. If I could pull it off, then these would be good enough. A couple of pieces were nonsense garbage. They really weren't that expensive, and it didn't matter. 
It wasn't until the last two where I found myself wondering what the hell I had gotten myself into. I opened up the page and it had hand-drawn sketches of adults and kids. They were naked, but they weren't explicit. At first, I wasn't sure what I was looking at and thought it might be some medical journal, but then I realized it was a butcher's diagram of meat cuts. These pages looked used like they had been read many times and even used in a greasy environment. I read the descriptions and almost lost my dinner. There were recipes for some of the most popular dishes we all know and love which included anything from sizzling steaks to stuffed mushrooms and lasagna. They talked about how to get the most tender pieces and where and from whom to get the cuts. There were pictures of the carving knives and pans to use. At the end of the booklet, which was obviously pieced together by taking pictures with a camera and put together in one big JPG, there was a link to submit your own recipes. A freaking link. I don't know how I managed to download this horrible monstrosity of a link, but I pray nothing was sent back to these people. I don't know what to do or where to get rid of it. Do I send it to the cops? The feds? Have I done something illegal myself? I hope it didn't send these creeps my IP address. I was a student at my local university, planning my major to be somewhat in the field of archaeology, but I never really worked on the specifics of it. Anyway, you will read these stories to get some fear driven into you, huh? The good old-fashioned longing for campfire stories goes back. Oh, I can only guess, since we as human beings didn't even understand what fear was. Of course, I studied all of this in my historical literature class. Up until it all happened, I viewed this class to be of the least eventful or time-worthy. Actually, come to think of it, the professor, for the most part, had the same attitude as me towards his class. I guess 30 years teaching the same uninterested college kids will wear a guy down. One day, however, it changed. The professor, Dr. Welford, decided to give the class a new and different type of assignment. It was simple, to the point, and almost too easy. Find a story that incited the most horror into people, made post-internet age and examine the factors of what made it startling to people. When I heard the prompt, I had almost been perplexed at the ease that night's homework would be. Aside from the random history documents I had to look over for the class, this sparked my interest. I got home that day and fumbled through my backpack for my laptop, but not before dozing off a few times to some late night reruns of Rick and Morty. I must have fallen asleep as when I opened my eyes after what I wanted to be a quick rest, I started towards my computer taskbar to see the time, 3.30 a.m. You've all heard it before, the classic wake up at 3.30 scenarios, but didn't bother me in the slightest. I'm pretty sure all the university life had practically turned me nocturnal at this point. Feeling rested enough, I popped open the new tab on my laptop and prompted Google for a new search. Scariest story ever told. I pressed enter and immediately I was fluttered with the usual garbage, BuzzFeed articles and top 10 YouTube videos. I even came across a few no-sleep stories on Reddit, some of which I found myself reading casually, although being the overlord of procrastination, I finally convinced myself to get to real business. 
I flew past a few results and finally landed myself on a Wikipedia page. The page contained a few of the most recently uncovered myths and urban legends of ancient times. The articles talked about the basics of storytelling and how it evolved into the show business that we have today. However, after a few minutes of skimming this, something I thought rather particular caught my eye. Along one of the thin columns of sources listed in the article was one hyperlink simply entitled Cowhead. Fascinated by the randomness, I clicked out of my own curiosity. The page that the link led me to was a simply formatted old-style Wikipedia page. It actually didn't look like it had been edited since the old days of the internet, detached from the rest of the site. I'll admit that it gave me a bit of a scare. I don't know why, it just seemed like the whole page was off. I skimmed a few paragraphs of what I could only make out to be plain Japanese writing. Not traditional, though. Like something straight out of a child's gibberish, I'd like to say. I had taken a few years of Japanese in my high school gear, so I knew enough to recognize most of the article was nonsensical. There were, however, a few paragraphs of English I could read mainly just summarizing the dangers of a particular folktale of unknown origins with the name Gozu. It was probably the most unorganized article I had ever seen on Wikipedia. I don't remember seeing a single-sided source or author anywhere on the page. Goddamned weird, I thought to myself. I scattered past a few more lines of babble and read the remaining English portion. The article went on to state that the tale of Gozu was not written by man, but by an otherworldly source of darkness. The way it was worded was strange and unnerving. I found myself reading this bizarre page lazily until I felt the burning wrath of my hot-as-hell laptop sitting on me. I checked the time again. 4.11. I decided I would rather sacrifice a grade to avoid first-degree burns on my lap for my shitty laptop. I sat up and adjusted myself into a comfier, what I like to call, staying up till four in the morning position before tossing my computer aside. Right before I closed it, however... I saw one last thing that stood out to me on the wiki page. It was blue. Blue text. It had probably been the only link on the entire damn page, which is what I suppose got me. It was a standard hyperlink which read, More info, in plain italics. I didn't see the point of it at the time, as if it even mattered anyway. I was totally failing the assignment, but I couldn't resist. Don't know what it was. It's just one of those things where you see it and you can't hold your peace. So I clicked the link. I should have never clicked the link. I'm going to warn you. If you're going to be as dumb as I was at this point, and you're thinking, you should attempt this for yourself, I have news for you. Please don't. The link had led me to what at first was a blank gray page with no address bar or landing screen. As per usual, I thought of this as being a dead-end backlink. Wouldn't be surprised. For all I know, the wiki page that led me there was probably older than me. Once again, another sign to sleep like a normal individual. Before I could gesture to the back button on my browser, in an instant the page burst into life with several white chat boxes lining the screen. At first glance, I assumed it to be an old form thread, the most archaic form page I have ever witnessed at that. 
The format of the page was ancient. It reminded me of the earliest software I had worked with in my sophomore computer science class, at least from the mid-90s. On the site were two clearly inscribed links, next page and search, with nothing other than boxes of text created by the forum users. The strangest thing about the place was the absence of a landing page or URL. It was simply a sequence of random numbers with no .com or .anything. I started skimming through the posts in an effort to find something worth reading. Hell, it was five in the morning, I thought to myself. I had come this far to what had to have been an archaeological discovery for the internet itself. The first sentence I read started the first thread was what hooked me. So you have the proper encryption tools for this document, right? A user asked. There didn't seem to be any user names, so you'll have to bear with me through the characterization here. Another user replied, Ha! You seem rather anxious over there, don't you? LOL. Listen, I got everything fucked up and a little horror monger could need. I read on to the next reply. Okay, man, I'm not going to be caught red-handed with this thing. You have no idea what the authorities will do to secure something like this. At this point, I was blown away at what I was clearly reading. It was an old drug crypto drug deal. I would assume before any of the deep web crap existed. I went on and read the last reply. You are the one who has no idea what you've gotten into. Here's the download to the PDF. Have fun. The last bit confused me. Surely PDF files didn't exist in those days. Definitely not downloaded attachments. I scanned the page for anything else until my eyes darted to a timestamp directly above the post. Updated one hour ago. Words could not describe what I felt after reading that. How in the hell could this page have been updated an hour ago? I hovered my cursor over the attached document below the last post. For what I could see at that time, there was nothing but a foreign title to the attachment. I hesitantly clicked the file, and after a second, I saw a download prompt appear at the bottom of my screen. I can now see the file's name in its entirety. I wasn't fluent in the Japanese. I had spent the latter half of my high school life learning, but once again, I could denounce that it was nothing but gibberish. I ran it through my Norton software twice to be safe. Norton could not run the file for some reason. Nothing. Both times. I kept getting a diagnosis error. Obviously recognizing the mistake I could be making, I opened the document up anyways. My default Windows text reader wouldn't open it either. It would simply display the same error message cannot read application. It was as if Windows itself knew something was very, very, very wrong with the document and refused to read it. I finally managed to force run the file through command prompt. The file opened with a rich text document. At first, I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. Oh God. Why did I open the file? It was pure madness, all of it. The first thing that got me was the absurdly large text in pure traditional Japanese. It was obnoxiously big, bigger than what I thought was the maximum font size for text readers. I could identify that all it said was go back over and over and over again. I began reading below the ridiculous text. It got even more incomprehensible as I went along, but I could understand it somehow. I kept reading. I couldn't pull my eyes away from 
what they were absorbing. It was evil, darkness, terrible things were flying through my mind as I read on. I kept reading. I didn't know what the fuck I was reading, but at the same time, I understood everything. Unspeakable horrors passed through every fiber of my being as I read faster and faster down the seemingly endless page of foreign tongue. I tried to stop. I knew whatever this was, it was very, very wrong. I had to stop. I tried to pull away with all of my strength. I had to stop reading these horrific words. I envision endless suffering, fear, anguish. Everything in me wanted to escape. I felt as if my mind itself was trying to run away with what it was experiencing. I saw war, blood, hunger, death. It was as if all pain and terror experienced by all humans in history passed through at one moment. I wanted to die. I wanted nothing else in that moment but death to escape the evil I was experiencing. At this point, my eyes mindlessly combed the page as my vision faded before it all went black. I remember looking down at something towards my left arm. It looked like another arm adjacent to mine, but not of a human. It was a hoof, the leg of a bull. As I dropped my head, I felt the presence of large eyes barge through me. I awoke the next day late to my first and second period classes. My head had been lying on the rough texture of my laptop's keyboard. I stared up to glance at the time, only to see Windows error reboot on my screen. I had an unimaginable migraine, feeling lackadaisical and discombobulated. I struggled to fully comprehend what had happened. I glanced at my computer once more. Your PC ran into a problem and had to restart. I got up and moved slowly across my dorm to my old-fashioned digital clock to check the damage. It was 10.42 a.m. Ah, shit, I said to myself. At that point in time, I was completely dumbfounded at what exactly happened. I... I... Ugh, I really want to know but I cannot remember. At this point, I thought maybe I had slipped a few drinks in as I normally did from time to time. I started to grab my things and throw on a pair of the nicest pants I could find in the first five seconds of looking. I scuffled over to close my laptop and dropped it into my bag, but not before looking at it once more. Your computer failed to boot up. Error code. And then, some weird characters I hadn't seen before. I didn't even have any other language than English set up on the thing, so it confused me at the time. But I brushed it off and turned the whole thing off, the manual way, before scurrying out the door. I did end up remembering that night, slowly over time, and countless self-forced therapy sessions with the school psychiatrist I pieced together the events that took place. I, I can't come to a full rational thought about what I read, even now. My mind feels like shutting it all down, burying it all in the deepest corner of me. However, despite my delusional state, I have come to recall just what I read on that document in detail. It started out with a description of an area in what I think is Northern Mongolia or Japan. There was intricate detail on a harsh lack of food and water. Death itself seemed to be lingering upon the land. I read about men and women dying, villages being overthrown and ransacked by other villagers seeking food. But there was one village in particular 
one village was in the same condition as all the rest. But there was something different. The men and women were corrupt, cannibalistic, committing unspeakable acts that I actually can't recall in great detail, fortunately. And right at the brink of total extinction of the village, a visitor approached from afar. A creature or entity, something the story described as a warrior with the head of a bull. The concept as surreal is almost seemingly childish in nature. I know, but it was wrong. Something about it was so wrong. In fact, the villagers attacked it, killed it and feasted upon the bizarre body of this thing in the last attempt at survival of the harsh famine. The story at this point gets cloudy. Evil poured down that village. Evil like none other. A type of evil that crushes the malevolent nature of all dictators and fairy tale antagonists. I think it was at this point I passed out. You know that your brain is programmed to simply shut down if it's experiencing too much fear. Too much sheer terror. I know I'm not free yet. I know that. No matter what I do. Eventually. I will remember more and more of the story. Every day I wake up, I feel more of it. Creeping from within the darkest depths of my conscious being. I need help. And for all of you asking if I don't cover it, no, I never recovered my laptop. I took it to the Microsoft store where they had tried every technique in the recovery process. Eventually, it came to dismantling the computer itself. What they found was the strangest part of all of this. The interior was in shambles. The hard drive was scratched beyond recognition. The motherboard obliterated and a several inch hole burnt through the processor. Whatever had done this, much damage to my PC, was doing it from the inside out. Please, whoever reads this, I continue to write, not with motivation, but out of a burning desire to warn. Don't go snooping around looking for things not meant to be found. Some stories originate from the deepest pits of hell with only a purpose of destroying sanity itself. Some stories are better left untold. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, terrifying, dark web stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes, along with the gifted membership. Patty's niece, Samantha Blaze, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S., Tina Mead, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugared Spite, Mrs. Innerscare, and Anita B. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillars that holds this channel together. I can't love you or hug you or thank you enough. I think you get the gist of all that mushy stuff. <laughs> Our gifted memberships, the Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Gregg, Nat Davies, and the Cryptid Sleeps. I appreciate you all being here and for your support. To the other subscribers and listeners, thank you so much for supporting Back to Ashes. It really does mean a lot to me, because without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.